In theory, SSRF is a really simple vulnerability class. You can make requests to arbitrary locations. But in practice, there are so many questions. What functionalities are actually vulnerable? Do we really need all the crazy SSRF payloads we've all seen? And finally, how are people proving the impact of SSRFs in real life? I wanted to know answers to this question. So I went on the internet and I extracted 361 bug bounty reports, then filtered them out and categorized them to learn how are people actually making money with SSRFs. I shared the whole case study along with the database of those reports in BBRE Premium, but in this video I will show you what functionalities are most likely to be vulnerable to SSRFs. Enjoy! Turns out that the functionality most likely to be vulnerable to SSRFs is different kinds of upload by URL functionality. In many cases, this meant uploading avatars or something with, with avatars or otherwise images. Um, but what I want you to note is that many of these SSRFs are actually blind. Not many of these functionalities gave the attacker the ability to read the response, which is crucial if we want to get the highest impact, even though the well the highest bounty was 15,000 and it was a report from 2021, and it was a blind SSRF, uh, but it was escalated to an RCE uh, using the Gopher protocol and uh, Redis, if I remember correctly. The next highest bounty was 12,000, and it's a report that I also covered on my channel. It's an SSRF in Grafana where uh, Rhino Hater combined, I think, three open redirects to get this vulnerability. Otherwise, we have quite a lot of $500 payouts or lower payouts, uh, often due to the fact that this only allowed a blind exploitation. The next group of vulnerabilities is upload by upload uh, functionality. It's a bit different because in that case, the app really allowed us to input a URL to, to import something from the remote resource. And it's quite obvious to test for SSRFs. I think this is the first functionality that I think about when I think about um, SSRFs. In file upload, however, we are uploading a file from our local computer and the processing of the file actually causes the server to make a request where it shouldn't make the request. There were 17 reports like this, but out of them, six were FFmpeg CVEs. It's a, a video format where it was possible to make uh, requests to arbitrary locations or even read local files. And in each case, remember that this is a sample size of 124 reports because a very small percentage of all bug bounty reports are actually disclosed. So if we have six reports here, it probably means there are tens or hundreds of reports that are not disclosed about the same bug. And so there were six occurrences of this. I think there are they are mostly from 17, 2016. Um, I don't know what is the freshest one, 2020 um, one payout. So I, I'm afraid that uh, it won't really work. Also, we have seven XXCs in, in this group. Uh, majority of them were in SVG files where you could trick the server into making a request into arbitrary locations. And with this group of SSRFs, the file upload SSRFs or file processing SSRFs, note how many of these allow using file protocol. It makes exploitation that much easier because you can just read a local file on the server and I would assume that some of similar reports to what I have here are reported and maybe even disclosed, but aren't reported as SSRFs, but as arbitrary file reads, which I would say in this context doesn't really make a difference. The next one is different uh, functionalities in regards to headless browsers. So the server takes an HTML from the user or some input from the user and renders the HTML on the backend, usually to 
create a PDF or generate an image. There were nine reports like this. And I think this is one of the promising functionalities because I feel that more and more um, servers are utilizing headless browsers for, for different tasks. So that's definitely something to, to look, look out for. In seven out of these nine cases, uh, there was iframe SRC payload used. And almost all of these SSRFs allowed uh, full read of the response, which also made the impact greater. Then the next functionality, uh, only one report less, was webhooks or some kind of checking server status. Uh, for example, let's take uh, this report from Google, where there was just a functionality to check if your Google Cloud server is up and running or not. It was called uptime checks. And in this case, there was actually no filtering uh, because the response wasn't directly shown to the attacker. So I think the developers didn't predict this can be used for SSRFs, but the hunter was able to exfiltrate the data of the response by using regexes and a blind exfiltration method, very similar to a blind SQL injection. I also covered this video, this bug bounty report in a video on my channel, and I also created a hands-on lab where you can try reproducing this. It was $31,000 SSRF, which makes it the highest paying one from, from this group. And I think this, um, this functionality is also quite obvious to test for SSRFs, which on one side is good, but on the other side, it's probably more and more likely that developers are also aware of this and uh, SSRFs in these obvious places uh, will be less and less common. Also, out of these, uh, these eight reports that I have here, the redirect was used in five of them, which is quite a lot. So you didn't need a, any complex payloads, octal encoding, nothing like this. All you needed to do was uh, to use a redirect and the server didn't did check the location of the original URL, but not when following the redirect. Let's go uh, next with actually the same amount of reports. There is a different proxying functionality where um, the server was making a request on the backend, uh, probably to some microservice or to some external API and it was possible to, to trick the server into making a request into a location controlled by the attacker. Note how many of these reports are relatively recent. We have you know, 2020, 2021, 2022. If you compare this with, with these previous bugs, it seems like it's, it's a quite a new vector. And I think uh, this is one of the more promising um, results of this case study because probably um, it's very trendy to, to have more complex uh, backend functionality on the servers. Instead of the monolith, we have like microservices, different APIs, external APIs as well. So in many cases, the server will make requests using our input. And in some cases, um, we can utilize this to create SSRFs. In this case, um, often it was enough to, to just send a valid parameter to the user. In the full version of this case study, um, there is also a list of the parameters uh, with amount of occurrences. And it's no surprise that the URL parameter was the most common one. Um, stepping next to the group that I've called security mechanism or a library bug. Um, this means that the bug was found not in a particular application with a particular impact, but it was in software which uh, anyone can install in their own infrastructure or use as a library. Um, out of these seven reports, there are actually three um, that were sent to Stripe uh, about a smoke screen. Smoke screen is one of the targets that I challenged uh, when doing 100 hour challenge on Stripe. 
and I found a bypass of the denial is there and it's one of these seven reports and then two other people found yet another bypasses on the same functionality and I saw on Twitter someone mentioning yet another triaged bypass I don't know yet what it is um, but if you want to see that video um, about my initial bypass uh, then check out the, the card in your uh, top right hand corner and I like uh, bugs like this because for one the case study also showed how many reports were, were blind where report the SSRF didn't allow the attacker um, to read the response and in this case it's very hard to show the impact um, sometimes you can do a port scan but often you can't really do much and you don't know if this is impactful or not if it's an immature program they they won't check this for you and probably considering that most reports were blind from these disclosed disclosed ones i'm sure that there are many many more blind ssrfs out there that are just not reported because it's hard to show the impact of them or they have no impact because it is also possible so on the other hand when looking for bugs in, in libraries or security mechanisms, we don't have to care about this because um, the, the library is like abstract, so they, they don't know what's in their client's infrastructure. So if there's a bypass, uh, it's a clear impact and you don't have to actually scan the target's infrastructure, which can also get you in trouble in some cases. Then with the same amount of reports, we have file storage integration and it can be can seem as similar vulnerability to the file uploads category, but it's actually completely different. In file uploads category, we uploaded the file from our local computer and the server was processing these files. In file storage integration, um, we upload a normal file to the server and it tries to store it on Amazon S3 or on Google Drive or something like this. For example, um, very recently I covered this great blog post um, about the SSRF in Dropbox. It, it used a very clever trick and it's basically this kind of bug. The server tried to fetch something from Google Drive, but the attacker was uh, able to trick the server into making a request um, into the into another host basically giving him the full read SSRF as we can see here um, there were also a few Amazon integrations and things like that and I also think this category might be um, growing in in future years because also seems like many applications these days tend to use external solutions instead of developing something themselves. Mm, that's why cloud is becoming more popular. So mm, I would also guess this is the direction. The next, we have a group called Sentry Integration. And I was quite surprised because I did not know about, uh, about this attack. In fact, I still don't know exactly how this, how this attack works. I didn't really dig deep. But the fact that there were four reports here shows that it was a big case. Um, these reports are from 2018 and 19, so I would assume they, they no longer work, but uh, it seems to have been a big case. A Sentry is uh, for, for some kind of um, analytics, I think report reporting CSP errors also worked with, with Sentry and there was some kind of misconfiguration there. And probably you won't find this one in 2022, but maybe it's a good idea for a research to try to find a similar bug in currently used uh, solutions for that. And maybe you can try to turn it into a bug that you can report to many, many programs. Um, all of these four were blind, which reduced the impact, but um, one guy got three and a half thousand for this. So it was a good a good bug. Next, we step to the reports that only have two occurrences in these disclosed ones. Um, there were two reports where simply the server made a request to the uh, target from the host header, which uh, 
in this case, it actually uh, it was in GitLab in 2019 for a $4,000 payout. Uh, so also a good bug, mm, but we'll step step next. Next, we have a class that I called email configuration, and it was about uh, the ability to control the email domains. Um, I think one of these was uh, signing up with your own your own email domain and the server made the request to, to your server. Um, one of this is in great blog, blog post by Donut, uh, where I think three or four SSRFs in, in one blog post. Uh, the other one was this one, blacklist bypass for mail account addition. addition so quite a specific uh, functionality. And it's one of the very few reports uh, when I saw these kind of payloads. Uh, so basically what we all know from, from different SSRF cheat sheets, um, this is actually, I think the only, the only one when I see, when I saw something like this, like uh, 32 bit hex conversion and things like that, usually much simpler uh, things worked like IPv6. And even in this case, we can see that he just outlined all the things that worked. So if you, if you wanted, probably uh, one of these would be enough. Let's go next uh, to actually the last uh, functionality that I, uh, that I have prepared. Only one report about the um, first request line. And I, when doing this case study, I initially uh, created you know, very detailed labels and categories. But the longer I got into studying these reports, um, the better I knew which one are too specific, which ones are too broad. Um, and I tried to, even at, after the second round of categorizing, find out the ones with like one with one category and merge categories with each other. Um, but I made an exception for, for this one. First, because um, literally, I think in the last issue of uh, of BBR Premium, I wrote about uh, this behavior, about proxying requests using the first line and why it works, uh, because uh, I was not doing it for SSRF study. I was for some reason reading an RFC and I saw that this is uh, like the RFC compliant uh, behavior. And also this report was six and a half thousand dollars um, and it is relatively fresh because it's 2020 that's why i i made an exception and uh, made a category for a single report these are all the functionalities that i labeled using my case study i hope this will help you find more ssrfs if you are interested in the full version of this, this case study you can find out there the list of vulnerable parameters you can see which payloads actually worked uh, in real life, which bypasses were necessary, how many SSRFs were blind, and also how people were showing impacts of, uh, of SSRFs, and also my conclusions uh, after doing this whole case study, even though I mentioned some of my conclusions in this video. And also I shared the whole database with 315 reports, um, so you can just filter them yourself, find out what's interesting for you. Um, I only did this case study on those reports with a bounty. Uh, there were 124 of them, but in the database, there are all 315 reports. It's available on BBR Premium Platform. I encourage you to join and I guarantee that you won't regret this. You will get instant access to the whole um, archive of over 200 articles from the past year from BBR Premium. And also every two weeks you will receive uh, access to the new ones. It only costs $10. On my blog, I also wrote about how I created this case study. And there is no rocket science, only some time invested. So if you can't or don't want to spend 10 bucks on BBR premium access, feel free to repeat the study using the steps from my blog post. And if you want to join, go to bbre.dev slash premium. For now, Thank you for watching and goodbye.